summarize what I did last time, because I think a fair amount of you probably didn't see it, and it might be helpful. Um, what I did was basically walk through in some detail the 2012 election, where uh, I took the material that my colleagues and I, my colleagues specifically Paul Jorgensen and Ji Chen and I, we wrote a piece, it's up on your website, it's in the International Journal of uh, Political Economy, um, on the 2012 election, what we do is what really nobody else does, which is we take the Federal Election Commission data and the IRS data. The IRS gets into this because uh, so-called 527s, which are a bit form of enormous amounts of money, are, are reported to them, not to the Federal Election Commission. Um, and we actually work through in enormous detail with computer programs. Um, trying to sort through the various the zillions of different names that people use and their addresses to get a kind of standardized identity, which allows us to actually sum uh, total contributions by folks. Um, this, I mean, if you, get, if you ever look at real election data, you'll find that people, I mean, if they give more than one contribution, they might do it with their initials. They might do it with one first name. They might have several residences, and in, you know, in, you, there are patterns that anyone can see, New York uh, and Florida, for example, uh, with a funny tendency for contributions you know, in January uh, to come in from people with the same name in New York for Florida, uh, things like that. Well, when you actually do that, um, you get quite a different picture of total cash in. Uh, because it's a lot more concentrated than, than folks thought. The other thing is, is that everything that applies to individual names in that data applies to corporation names too. Actually, um, I mean, there were I mean, even in 2012 there were even some contributions coming from de apparently defunct, uh, defunct banks that had been bought by one of the larger big ones. I mean, once you knew who the subsidiary, who it really was, it was pretty easy. But if you didn't, you were lost. Um, and so last time, I put up on the board a sort of big uh, table that shows you uh, two really interesting things. One is from unitemized contributions, read small contributions, less than $200 uh, total. The Democrats, in, uh, the, uh, let's be more precise, not the Democrats, but the Obama presidential campaign, um, had about twice the rate of those of the, of the uh, what ended up being the Romney campaign. Uh, around 37% of all its money coming uh, in those smaller contributions versus 18 or 19 from uh, the Republican side. In that sense, you know, your image of the Democrats as somehow having a tie to smaller uh, contributors and thus presumably closer to ordinary people um, has some basis in reality. On the other hand, uh, what you also uh, could see in the table is when you summed up the folks uh, who contributed uh, more than a thousand bucks to ten thousand, but then the ten thousand to a hundred, and then above a hundred thousand, um, they actually dwarf that. That is to say, the great bulk of the money in both parties is coming from. Uh, in contribution dollops of more than a thousand bucks, uh, or if you like, you want to go down a little bit, it doesn't cost you much, like three percent, five hundred dollar dollops. Um, this is a nice way of saying, in other words, that uh, political finance as an active uh, program uh, is really a game of the one percent, or perhaps the one and a half percent. You can work that up with various numbers depending on what year you think. Um, folks, uh, what year you want to take as 1% or 1.5% or whatever. I mean, and, and, and all of that's in the piece I wrote, and you can just, you know, not, don't read my lips, read the piece. Uh, okay, so, um, and then we were talking about the implications of that kind of a table, because then the thing what you really want to do is break that out. Um, that is to say, okay, so now we know what you always kind of suspected, that the super rich pretty much dominate political finance. Um, and then the next question is, are they the same or overlapping 
in all the parties. It's very easy to show, and I had another table that did that with my, that my colleagues and I produced, that they're not. Um, that, for example, in the Republican Party, you, you can see a big block of industries that the nicest thing you can say is that they hate anything to do with the word climate change uh, and that they pollute like crazy. Uh, that's coal mining, uh, mining in general, uh, chemicals, oil, uh, paper, um, a couple others. Um, and you didn't have to be real smart to see this. They were also lopsidedly Republican. By contrast, some other industries bounced around. In a talk like this, I won't try to recap that whole talk. Um, <coughs> what is kind of interesting, and I'll come back to it today, is there were some sectors that uh, either preferred Obama outright, or you couldn't distinguish their preference for him from their preference uh, for Romney, and these were essentially in high-tech, electronics, defense, um, and, and several versions of what you might call Silicon Valley. Um, and uh, the financial community was sort of split. That's what I sort of walked through last time in detail. Um, and, you know, the, the conclusions, I, I said I'd be, uh, I wanted to extract uh, a bunch of uh, important points from that, but they have to do more to do with how can you use this method to tell you things about the long-run evolution of the system, either in the past or even better in the future. Um, and so, I, you know, one thing I, I want to observe, since some folks uh, raised the question last time, when you look at this stuff empirically, you find actually on this point what a lot of other people who tried to do it generally less comprehensively find, which is you never, or almost never, see cases where people split their contributions 50-50 or something like that. Or the image that's very popular among folks who haven't looked at this stuff, um, that, well, all parties are equally bought by everybody. Uh, which, you know, if you're an ordinary human uh, and looking at the level of ordinary parties, you can easily understand how that uh, impression could come. There's nothing crazy about that. Uh, if your concern is, what are your chances of getting a job uh, in the next year and you're out of work, there isn't much difference between the parties, uh, I regret to say, uh, which is, of course, part of the Democrats' current problem with uh, trying to hang on, in particular, to the Senate. Um, but when you start to look, well, uh, sort of take a finer approach to that, in particular, if you just actually look at where people actually get, you get a completely different approach. In that sense, some of the claims that the Pearson and Hacker claim uh, that uh, well, the most of business just prefers Republicans and they uh, just give to Democrats for insurance. There's no empirical warrant for that. These people just didn't do any real uh, campaign finance analysis. Okay. Um, now, uh, that, uh, that analysis I did uh, last time also posed a few peculiar <coughs> problems, which I'm glad to talk about in the question period, but I don't want to get in the way of my discussion right now which is, mm, yes, it is troubling that the sectors that were most likely to like Obama uh, were also precisely the folks who were doing the surveillance. But that Snowden revealed that uh, for people who thought in 2008 that they had put an end to the sort of national surveillance state, boy, was that wrong, as we now all know. Um, but all right, let's <coughs> set that stuff to a side. I, I want to talk about the sort of long-run evolution of systems and how people have analyzed them. Now, there has been for many, many years uh, a sort of view that was once quite popular, though dominant would be too strong in American political science, of realignment theories. There were a whole bunch of books. Walter Dean Burnham um, was probably the best known. Uh, James Sundquist, yet another, uh, B.O.K., there's a string of folks. That, this was well represented and it, lay, it, it did a huge amount of voting analysis uh, there. That got roundly trashed out by political scientists. There was, I mean, the original, I mean, the, <clears throat> some of this was the best, the nicest thing I can call it is incoherent nonsense. Uh, but some of the critics, for example, would uh, one original line of thought was all of the changes in voting turnout that people were looking at were some kind of artifact of mass fraud, which went on decade after decade. Everybody knows. I think it's fair to say that that's complete nonsense uh, now. And people ought to, you know, have been embarrassed that they ever actually made the claims uh, there. 
Um, but uh, especially in the last 15 or 20 years, even by people who would accept the reality of the turnout uh, changes, which Burnham really pioneered uh, there, um, people started trashing out realignment theory. And when David Mayhew's book came out early in this century, uh, I, I think it's probably fair to say it was widely hailed in political science. And the usual view was realignment theories couldn't make, after that kind of fell into disuse. It was sort of, eh, like Egyptology. I mean, I meet younger political scientists who have almost no knowledge of it, uh, for example. Uh, though I, by that, I'm not actually conceding to date myself to an Egyptian dynasty. I mean, this is within living memory, for God's sake. Uh, well, okay. Um, I always, I, when I read Mayhew's book, this particular point, quotation uh, struck my eye, and lots more. But this one, because Mayhew was, this is very much uh, a late 90s view of America, which was a sort of third way, everything is really wonderful. Uh, in the American polity, and, and, and we can, in effect, just tell stories uh, there. I think it's, uh, if you, when you read Mayhew, there's a strong streak of postmodernism uh, running through it in its analysis. And oddly, for a thing that talks about election analysis, it's almost data free. It really only talks about two runs of data, and one of them is somebody else's um, there. And it's a, it's a real short run. Anyway, I thought the book was pretty weak, and uh, so I took it upon uh, myself with my, two, with my friend Ji Chen. Uh, we sort of thought, hey, why doesn't somebody do like modern statistics on this? Which for all of the talk, people actually didn't really do. Um, and, and so we did a Box Jenkins approach um, to a time series, put it on national data, and didn't have any trouble finding the traditional realignment dates. Uh, that is to say, the, the sort of not unanimous, but widely held view. And, and this is one where I said that you don't need any election analysis to sort of do this. In the 1820s, you went from either one or no political parties on a national basis to two. That, if that isn't some kind of major realignment, I don't know what would qualify. And similarly, the birth of the Republican Party, but rising from nothing to uh, take over actually the government. Uh, and then cause it, that, that ought to count as some kind of major electoral love people. The people then would have these big fights over dates. Um, and the stuff that uh, sort of went into the canon, if you like, where it's generally an election in 1896, uh, widely thought to have changed big patterns in American life. It, it turned the South sort of into solid dem democratic terrain. It uh, turned the Northeast and Midwest into solidly republic. Republican domain, and the West kind of up for grabs, but more Republican than not, with a national majority. And then the point that Burnham really pushed home uh, was, and there was a stupendous fall in voting turnout. And, and Burnham then went on to say, uh, and this was pretty plainly uh, outside the South, uh, the advent of industrial capitalism. Now, uh, a whole bunch of Converse, Burnham, Rusk, a string of political scientists all ridiculed that. But there actually wasn't a test, um, as amazing as you'd sound. Um, they just didn't do it. Um, and uh, uh, let me finish the sketch of the realignment. Yes, everybody agreed the New Deal counted as one. And there was a problem in the late 60s. Um, okay, or was there or was there not? There were all kinds of arguments. I mean, one interpretation of these realignments was they were kind of like big bangs, which would occur sometimes with a generational change. That's not a view, I think, that you really want to hold, but we can talk about that later. Anyway, that, what, what struck me as I was looking at this about, you know, 2003, 4, 5, was why doesn't somebody test some of these propositions? So as I say, my colleague Chen and I ran uh, a sort of Box Jenkins model and got the conventional dates. That's, you know, the, um, especially 1896, 1932, and an end to that New Deal system in 68. Now, we did a few things there that other people hadn't done. We put turnout, I mean, there was, all, there was a lot of flipping back and forth in the older literature on, are you, is it voter turnout? or a balance of two parties, could you find a variable that would do both of those? That 
what we used was the percentage of Democrats um, out of all possible electorates uh, voting. In other words, uh, counting the non-voters so that you, when, when the non-voters go up in big numbers and they vote either more or less Democratic, that number can bounce around. Uh, all right, so I'll, I'll come back to that maybe <laughs> in a bit. Um, but the other thing we did in that paper, which is up on your uh, website there, um, is like it's not hard to test the proposition that outside the South, the voter turnout was associated with industrial capitalism. How would you do it? Although people, you know, spent 20 years in political science saying this was untestable. The answer is pretty straightforward. You just get the state differences. You take the change in value added in, uh, in industry per capita in the various states outside the South. Nobody thought the South was anything other than uh, an agricultural story and elites with, with ex-slaves and sharecropping. Um, just take the non-Southern states and test to see if the states that have the big voter turnout drop-off uh, also have the big change in value added, industrial value added per capita. Say from eight, the year, I think I actually it was 1885 to 1929 or so, that was given by what numbers were around. Guess what? That number works just fine. You get a, just a very nice regression on that. I conclude that uh, the whole discussion of uh, voter turnout, uh, Bernard got it right. Uh, and yeah, it was associated with the spread of industrial capitalism. The more of it you had in the non-southern states, the lower your voting turnout went uh, until the New Deal. Um, and all the folks who said that was untestable, well, that you know, it was it's easy to test and just just do it sometime. Now, why am I interested in this? You could think of this as uh, a sort of Gilded Age outcome, right? I mean, we can all argue about exactly, I mean, the old, the phrase goes back to Mark Twain, I think. Um, but uh, when people tell you you're living in the new Gilded Age, I want to think about this for a second. And that's where I'll, I'll eventually want to go um, in a bit. But um, so my, my take was actually the realignment stuff made some sense, but the heart of the thing particularly people had trouble with was what, what makes these things durably real, realignments. And people had tried to sort of do that with party identification. Um, now, sometimes that makes sense, and sometimes it doesn't. And, you know, when does it make sense? Well, it's not too difficult to see why people would become enthusiastic Democrats in the middle of the Depression with Franklin Roosevelt. Right? I mean, why the sort of famous mobilization of enormous numbers of new voters and real conversion of folks who had, particularly in the sort of middle classes who voted Republican before, you don't need much of a why that, yeah, I mean, this was the first time the government had broken with laissez-faire. It, it, to be a little careless, but just for sort of purposes, I said, people are actually going to get something from their government besides, like, troops to break strikes, uh, or a big navy to steam around the world or something like that. You're going to get Social Security, uh, the, Nas the National Labor Relations Act, and things like that. Yeah, that, that would make you fairly enthusiastic. Now, on the other hand, you, you don't have to be real smart to figure out that could be a problem uh, with the 1896 realignment. Why? Because there, whatever you think is going on in that realignment, um, huge numbers of people are dropping out of the electorate. You know, if it's a big bang, it's one in reverse. It's the wrong thing. And that was always, I mean, in that sense, uh, trying to figure out uh, what's going on in the 1890s and using a sort of approach that through sort of people becoming enthusiastic Republicans when big chunks of the population are getting pushed out of the electorate or are dropping out. I mean, both of those processes, I think, happen. You need, um, you know, you're going to need a different approach. Um, and the approach I was taking yesterday, I think, actually admits of considerable generalization, uh, which is, hey, uh, you know, there's something else in these political systems uh, besides all of those voters. To wit, there is a lot of, there's money, and the money is institutionally rooted. Um, and so the, what you actually have in American history um, is you get uh, sort of whole blocks of industries uh, coming and going, 
And you should look for big changes in uh, patterns of politics associated with, if you like, patterns of political investment by uh, the folks in various industries. Uh, or just, just to repeat this point and make it clear, in effect, it's a suggestion you could walk through American history doing the sort of thing I did yesterday with these tables. Um, and just show, you, you, you might well find that these alignments are pretty stable, um, but they also change. Um, and that's essentially uh, my suggestion. Uh, now let me, let's see here, I hope I do this right. Um, yeah, this is just to repeat the point uh, I just made. Uh, now, um, let me quickly, yes, how would you change, the question is what would rapidly change patterns of alignments uh, in political investment? There are two things, I think, um, and uh, they're both pretty obvious. If you had data on, say, the structure of fortunes alone, you might be very happy to have that. Now that typically you got some of that. Uh, but you know, underneath, or if you like, but below the level of fortunes, they sit invested in particular places. And so a perfectly reasonable suggestion is maybe some firms get much larger than others. Maybe they, they you could imagine this as a continuous gentle process. Guess what? It's not. That's a fact. Um, it's been a famous problem in economics as to why it is not a general pro a sort of slow growing process. Merger w mergers come in waves. It's, it's a fact of not just about the United States but about other countries, which might lead to some questions about uh, what happens in those countries. I have to set that aside right now. I do. Ha I have done a lot of work on Germany, but the, not, not to keep anybody in suspense. The usual issue is. There, you're going to have. This is going to presuppose you've got a political system which doesn't have a labor party, which will dominate, you know, become the axis uh, of the system. And we can, we can explain that, unpack that later. Um, anyway, uh, the point is uh, when you actually look at American history in this regard, it is striking that all the big merger waves. If, you, if, for example, I mean, I did my um, with G. Chen, I did my analysis. Uh, of you know what years work for realignment, got the traditional dates, uh, and just did it on the basis of a mass of statistics. It's not my fault that that happens to coincide with merger waves. Now there are several ways to, mer to, to uh, measure merger waves. This one is in sheer numbers of firms. Uh, the if you took assets, you'd get a somewhat different deal, but peaks won't change. It does just change. Uh, the scale. The other problem you sometimes get is in the mid 80s, um, which is because there's a huge number of merger st uh, statistics collections where um, they count buyouts as mergers. That, from this standpoint, that's got to be wrong. I mean, when you just take an existing firm and change the management structure, you're not enlarging it at all. Um, the what what you want here is a what you want to see is what happens say uh, in the uh, 18 in, in the merger movement in 1895, which on other ways of approaching this is actually in proportionate terms the biggest the U.S. economy ever had. So the way I like to put it is the U.S. economy looks a lot more like it does today after 1895 than it did before then. Um, you get a situation like this. Um, the uh, steel industry, something like 34, 35 firms that were fairly sizable in it in the 1880s by, uh, well, really 1901, when U.S. steel is formed, you're down to about three. And one of them is gigantic. Um, the change in scale in this situation is really quite worth noticing. Um, the, uh, in the mid-1880s, there were something like five industrial companies that worth more than about five million dollars. Um, and one was a true giant, that was Standard Oil. Um, by 1901, you've got uh, a billion dollar steel company. And you have many other large firms uh, coming into existence. It's a truly gigantic change in scale. And it really happens in the course of just a few years. Uh, between roughly 1893 and 1901, with a bulk of that action 
uh, quite around it. Now, my, my take is, what's this doing? It's creating um, big business in a modern sense. The one qualification I'd add on that is that you should, if you were going to do this carefully, which I don't really have time for, you'd need to mention two other things. One, uh, a railroad consolidation that occurred right along with it, and which, guess what, made those bigger too. Um, and then the other one was, uh, surprise, surprise, when the industrial firms got bigger, so did the banks. Uh, and there's a very large uh, banking concentration. There is also, uh, in a longer discussion, we could talk about how investment banks, specifically J.P. Morgan and company, um, really rises much to the so-called, what people used to popularly refer to as the money trust sort of just comes right into existence and actually it's a the fine American financial system at that point is a strongly hierarchical system. Uh, but uh, the point is you get all of this happening in a few years. Um, and then if you look at this, can you explain why there'd be a sort of big change in interest there? What would turn all of these folks, what, what was the problem with the Democratic Party suddenly becoming so weak? There's a very straight answer to that. Um, which um, boils down to the fate of the gold Democrats. Gold Democrats used to be heavy in the banking industry, believe it or not. That is to say, it's, it's a little hard for folks to deal emotionally with the idea that bankers and used to think, but they were. Uh, and uh, for particularly in the 1880s and 90s, it was very, very common. What, what did coastal bankers in particular, what did they do? They financed trade. Uh, they were all uh, free traders. Um, when the, the, the trust revolution comes, when you create modern industry with, in the form of what people call trusts, then you can try to distinguish that from more modern business, but that's not right now. Um, the investment bankers end up becoming the dominant bankers of the age, and they get the same interest in high tariffs, pretty much, that they're in the, the industries that they now own. Um, and so you see that a lot of people leave the gold democratic fold uh, and they never come back. On the other hand, there is a big block of them and they stay in the Democratic Party. Um, I mean, people don't usually track this, but I mean, everybody knows that William Jennings Bryan uh, was the Democratic nominee in 1896, again in 1901, and then, uh, sorry, 1900, and then yet again, uh, one more time, three times in other words. Well, what? happened, however, when Brian wasn't running and actually managing to get the uh, nomination. The, the, the chairman of the Democratic Party was actually usually a banker in Boston or New York, believe it or not. A guy named George Foster Peabody, uh, the most common. Peabody lived right down to the 1936 uh, realignment. When you, If you look closely and hard in archives, you can find his letters to the owner of the New York Times on why a man named Franklin Roosevelt should be supported for his support of free trade. Um, the, anyway, my point is, is that you can, uh, you should re-examine the, you can make the politics and money connection much more directly than simply, gee, it's politics and money, and regard it as uh, a system of interests that it evolves over time, and you know, you can, People may indeed have different views as to how stable that is, but you know, here's what you'll find if you actually do this, because I've done a lot of it. Uh, if you, you, you can even imagine, this is a mouthful with no, with no diagram, but I'll try it anyway. Uh, plotting firms in a policy space, where are they on, say, trade and labor? Um, and then look and see where their cash is, and guess what? You'll find they're, they're not, if, if you plot where they actually are, uh, in terms of their industrial interests, and then look where they usually give, there's some mismatch, but not much. I mean, it's a sort of statistical scatter. So long and the short of it. Uh, so uh, my take was, all right, what you want to do, therefore, if you have a big merger wave, um, you probably want to look at the composition of that and see who's up, who's down, and how is that likely to change your politics, which does lead to the, I mean, there's the, now, the only diagram I could find that covered the course of American history um, was this one from Bowens, uh, which is on the web. Um, what actually, if we continued this down to 2012, what you see is this, the, 
There's a break, that's the famous market break that just as uh, George Bush came into office where Enron, and then it goes right back up like that. Um, and um, has pretty much continued. Um, if you want to regard that as sort of one wave, which is, I, that's certainly what I would do. So that is the U.S., right? That's for the, yes, that's for the U.S. I, yeah, I know, I understand. It's the U.S. No, no, thank you for the question. Yeah. Um, this is a turnout uh, diagram, and this, is, I admit, is a mess. I don't have um, the, uh, um, here's the bottom line. Um, I want to just note this for this talk. The steep fall, this is, of course, the Jacksonian rise. One way of regarding this is, okay, here's your party system once you get two parties. Um, in, after 1896, you see this stupendous turnout decline, which is differential. Uh, in the South, you just extinguish voting. I mean, you go, like in Virginia, in the mid-1880s, it's a point not everybody quite realizes the implications of. Voter turnout in Virginia was in the mid-80s, uh, in the 1880s, which meant that not only uh, that both poor whites and a lot of poor blacks were voting, that is extinguished for both the blacks and the whites if they're poor very quickly. By like 1912, 1915, you're down to like 10, 15%. The Georgia numbers you can hardly believe. Even in the mid-30s, Georgia voter turnouts are like 4, 5, 6%. I mean, just how staggeringly low these things are, uh, folks haven't quite really they don't really come to terms with it. And I find that, you know, for instance, younger folks that I teach, they sort of know they're, they've heard something about the South, but they have no idea of the, of the decline. And in particular, a point that I can't stress too much, it's not simply turning down African-American voters. It's essentially excluding the great bulk of the whites, too. Um, and the Democratic Party in the South is the only party in town. Anyway, that then comes back in the New Deal. Now, the thing that you want to watch is the, and I admit that on a diagram there's no particularly good way to do this. Um, you get a New Deal rise. Uh, I, I th when you do the numbers, I think 68 turns into a thing and it starts going back down. And then it's reversed a bit. In the last few years, you could see this great this that great substantial increase. I mean, I, I substantial increase in turnout. I, I went back in the 80s. There were I mean, there was a Morton side of me um, that will place a bet. We were approaching the point where the lowest modern voter turnout was in 1924, or about 47 percent, counting women. They were in the electorate at that point. Uh, of the possible voters. 47% um, of that potential electorate, to use the term there, uh, voted. Back in the 80s, we were in the off-year elections, and, and even in some of the presidential elections, we were getting pretty far down. Um, and I remember, we were all sort of speculating, could we actually bust um, the 24 record? In fact, what happened is turnout started to rise. I mean, it, it didn't rise enormously, but it's a substantial rise. The glacier getting up and running 300 yards is news. Um, and, you know, the, the, this, the turnout in 2008 um, was 63%, a very substantial uh, rise by comparison with what you've been seeing in, you know, a long time. Uh, what's interesting about that is if you want to, I mean, a lot of folks have discussed how do realignments happen? Well, you get a bunch of parties fairly fiercely competing. Now, they don't say over what, and late Gilded Age parties were not competing over stuff. It was third parties in that that were uh, the serious competition. But it's just a fact that the 1884, 88, 92 elections were very close. The parties did compete like crazy, and the turnouts were high. You could, I, it, even in 2003 and 4, when my friend and I wrote our piece, it looked you know, you might, you got a merger way, you got these parties competing, maybe you're going to have another, I mean, just, it's just an open question. Uh, but you might want to consider whether you're, you're not about to change your party system uh, 
in some fundamental fashion uh, there. And you know, here's my sort of sad completion from this. It looks to me, my guess is, just so you just lay it out, this is not something I would claim is statistically demonstrated at all. Well, yes, it sort of the world did work out that way in 2008. Um, you had a classic downturn. You've got uh, the parties were, and, and one guy, we well, you know it was Obama, won with a huge vote. Uh, he was all set to do a realignment, and then you know the rest of the story. In some sense, he, an unsympathetic being would say he blew it. What it really means uh, here is that uh, you now have this system that nobody likes much. Uh, when you, I, I was looking at some Democratic Party polling, not, it's the real polling for the votes, even though they're not formal Democrats, and this year, for example, that was saying quite straightforwardly uh, that, well, we cannot make, we, we can't run, their focus group study said you can't possibly run on how great life has been under President Obama for the average American, because everybody's repelled by it. The only thing you can do is do what they've done, which is to run on inequality. Uh, and effectively against the Republicans. It was the same, that work, that's made them squeak through uh, in 2012 uh, after the sort of 2010 disaster. Now, my take is, why did this happen? You know, here's my guess. Uh, you know, something could happen. I agree, contingency happens. I suspect what you'll find is the turnout won't be up this year, and a lot of normal Democratic voters probably won't turn out. Um, and, and I have this bad feeling that uh, your turnout pattern uh, is probably seen its peak. It probably won't go back up. I just just a quick question about yeah. that. Are the the peak. I mean, the zigzag character of this in the short it's the term. The on-year, off-year election. Yeah. So the down part is the is the is congressional the election. Yeah. 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 So. The, uh, <clears throat> the the thing. What let me. Come back to the, yes. Thank you. Let me come back to the just sort of. So what went wrong here? Yeah. When you had a guy with you know both houses of Congress all set. I mean, it was just sort of the classical stage for this. Well, all right. The problem was the leading sector, if you like, in the economy at that point was finance. The problem was finance, uh, and unfortunately, it's sort of the way I like to put it is it is as if. In 1932, uh, the Democrats had nominated Newton D. Baker, somebody who's totally forgotten, but who was, the, the, for a while, the lead rival to Franklin Roosevelt in, in the Democratic Convention. Let me unpack this uh, just a bit. The, if you've got, we, I, you've all seen these numbers, although they're usually too high. Uh, the percentage of all profits in American corporations, which is a funny number because there are non-corporate stuff, the, the highest corporate profits, and things aren't in those numbers. Never mind. Um, the bottom line on this is, in the early part of this century, 40% or more of all the profits in the economy were going to banks. Okay. Um, and then we all know what happened. Uh, <laughs> The, the whole financial sector collapsed and had to be rescued by the government. Uh, now, the, the Obama, I mean, we, I have a couple papers which we just didn't have space for on the banking crisis. Um, let me just sort of sort through this. And I mean, you will not, I think, find this all that far from anything you've read, though if some Republican senators might disagree. Um, the, uh, the bottom line, when Obama came in, um, he, his position was not like Roosevelt's, where the banks had collapsed and were actually shut, uh, where Roosevelt actually shut them on the day he came in. Uh, instead, the, the outgoing Bush people had thrown the biggest ring fence in world history around Citigroup. Uh, and you know, the Fannie and Freddie had been nationalized. Uh, and what the Obama administration did was very quickly help the major banks back on their feet. I mean, the, um, uh, and they allowed them very quickly to get out of their obligations uh, for aid under TARP. Um, 
and so they could go back to giving themselves bonuses real fast. And they were not made, I mean, they should have been made, for example, not to give themselves bonuses, but to uh, build up their capital. I mean, the case that's made by Adnan Admati and Martin Elway uh, in their well-known book on, is, is exactly right. Uh, that's not what the administration did. And then very famously, Geithner, it reappointed Bernanke and gave the job of Treasury Secretary to Geithner, who you know, had, had made one of the all-time key decisions, which was to pay off the AIG credit default swaps at full face value for in exchange for nothing, basically. I mean, it's, 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 it's certainly uh, a disgrace. Um, anyway, um, and things, and indeed, I think it was Rahm Emanuel who told everybody uh, when somebody squawked about something or other, I forget what it was, well, listen, you guys owe us a lot. You know, we're the only thing standing between you and mobs. That got into a bit of a problem uh, in the Senate election. In, in, when Ted Kennedy died, the special Senate election in, um, that was held in Massachusetts just happened to fall in the week the Goldman and Sachs and other bonuses were being announced. The popular anger at that really boiled over. Uh, and Scott Brown won the election uh, claim, running against banks while in fact taking a large sum of money from banks. I have a paper on the Roosevelt website on this. It's just that this, thus America grew great. You know, I mean, this, this is really the this is where you actually see what electoral commentary is usually worth. Um, the other thing you might note about Brown is at the time he ran, said he was a Tea Party candidate. Two years later, the Tea Party was gone and he was running as a moderate. He lost uh, and has now, fr uh, has now fled uh, to New Hampshire. The one constant thread was that he was uh, uh, always supporting banks and very famously held up the Dodd Frank. Uh, passage for some more concessions for State Street and a string of other uh, big banks. Anyway, the point is, is the, the, at that point, the administration panicked, and they rolled out Paul Volcker like two days later or so uh, with his reforms. Now, the Volcker, we could go on and on. This is something else I do. This is not the day for that. Um, the bottom line is simply Volcker reforms just don't add up to much. Nobody really believes they protect banks. They're still going into effect, but I would note that every time a European bank swoons uh, in the euro crisis, which for the time being they aren't because of the European central bank policies, the American bank stocks move too. I mean, not a soul believes that those things are uh, actually uh, patched. Uh, and this, this has led to a discussion about, well, how big is the advantage uh, that you get from too big to fail? Um, but my, my point is simply, that did cross wires with uh, the financial community. <clears throat> and uh, it, it showed in 2012, last time I, I sort of walked you through uh, yesterday, what that, the, the, the long story short becomes this, is that while big banks uniquely were friendlier to Obama than the rest of the financial community, um, everybody in the financial community pretty much preferred Obama, pre pre sorry, preferred Romney, with this qualification that there, there was a substantial number of investment houses that did go about, and he got a fair amount of money out of them. But the, 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 in past elections, almost all of them that I ever did, even in 1936, just set that aside, um, but in the mid 80s and 90s, I've done smaller samples and I always get the, the result that the investment houses uh, were much more pro-democratic than just about everybody else. That pattern didn't, and it held true in 2008. It did not hold true uh, in 2012. Um, and this sort of sits. My, my take is, therefore, if you're trying, and, and I one other point, just so we don't get um, the question that, why the, the much bruited question of the house, the non-settlement of the housing crisis by the Obama administration. Uh, the best study of this I know, uh, who's that controller general, or the, the, the inspector general for uh, the TARP program, just quotes it in his book there, um, where Geithner just says, uh, look, we had to foam the runway, meaning this that they couldn't solve the housing crisis by just, say, reducing the debt. Uh, 
because then the bank debts would have had to been written off. They'd have all been insolvent. Uh, put simply, you had to find a way to work that out very slowly over time so that you didn't have to write down the bank assets. This, this has been all about protecting large banks. It's why uh, you get these programs that we have all these poor people being asked, promised if you file a million pieces of paper, you might get a reduction. The banks keep throwing the paper back, uh, and it just drags on and on. Uh, well, anyway. All right. Um, so my take is what wrecked the realignment here would have been not, I mean, I, I should add that Obama came in. Now, I, here I claim you can go, you, if you do money in politics, you can go out of sample and forecast. I, I don't think, see the problem. And in 2008, I did. Uh, I had a piece in it's Daily Costs, actually, mm -hmm. uh, the first which just said, uh, I've done the early money. I did this in April, I think, of 2008. Uh, where I said, I've done the early money, and I have to say that Obama's a finance candidate, and you can just forget financial reform. So it's just like that. That sat on their website until 2012, then they took it out uh, because, well, yes. <laughs> so Eve Smith in Naked Capitalism, bless her heart, put the thing back up. Uh, but, um, well, all right. Uh, so my sense was, here was a case where the industrial uh, top, if you like, industrial financial uh, top, and the, uh, if you like, the mass base just fell apart, and the mass base uh, is, of course, the loser. Uh, now, so what uh, my conclusion is, you're sitting in a system that, yeah, it is a new political system. I, I mean, I don't, I'm not looking for big changes here. Um, it's... Uh, and so what can you tell, if you're living in a new Gilded Age, what can you tell from the old one, and in what ways might this one differ? Given that even the Democratic Party, as I, yesterday's lecture showed, is dependent on cash from the one or one and a half percent uh, there. And so my answer to this is basically, it's actually kind of interesting. If you look at the Gilded Age, I mean, when you I mean, think Newport, Rhode Island, and you'll get one really important aspect of it. If you ever go through Newport, you see these gigantic houses. Now, what Newport really was was a kind of outrigger of New York, where the Vanderbilts or whoever would go build a house, and their friends would come, and there was a huge traffic on Friday night. People would take steamers and go out, spend the weekend there, and then come back. Uh, stuff like that. Um, you could think of that as essentially, and what J.P. Morgan did was essentially, to put it somewhat metaphorically, take the savings of Newport and use that to become the most famous and powerful investment banker in America. That's the cash that sort of put uh, J.P. Morgan and company uh, on top of everything else. In that sense, there's this big process of concentration uh, that's going on. But the striking thing, and, and there is this process of concentration which takes very tangible form in the merger movement. Uh, there. Um, the thing about this, though, is how best, the easiest way to put this is that, well, the merger movement did create, like U.S. Steel is sitting in probably seven or eight states, maybe ten, uh, with the ability to directly talk to the congressional representatives there. That was something that did not exist even 10 years before. There was no possibility of that. Um, in, in, I mean, a single, a single company couldn't talk to 15 or 20 representatives all at once uh, as sort of sitting in their districts. You could give them money, and people did. If you ever read some of Matthew Josephson's books, which actually are, deserve, a, a complete, they deserve a redo, on modern data, but they are really much better than much of the stuff written by other historians. Uh, you can, like, follow Collis Huntington through as he tries to actually buy the entire Congress or close to it to get uh, a railroad bill through that was going to aid him. And, I mean, it, it's, it's quite an engrossing study. I'm not trying to tell you that large firms did not make purchases of congressmen and women uh, before that. Indeed, uh, I have a long essay in my Golden Rule precisely on this. But the scale of the business did change. Um, but the bottom line here is that 
the national market, if you like, for national politicians is emerging in the Gilded Age. On a rich, it's deep. The deepening of that market is going. Um, this often takes a very tangible form, nicely illustrated by Josephson. Again, when, for example, General Grant and others running or in office would come down and get a big testimonial dinner from uh, New York business groups, and they could do it in Boston, they could repeat it uh, in Philadelphia, things like that. So this is a this type of thing you could not do in the 1830s. There were, I mean, Abbott Lawrence gave William Henry Harrison a big loan in, what, 1840, and then, unfortunately for him, Lawrence, um, Harrison died in office too quick to do any of the things on the tariff and things that what Lawrence thought. Um, the, um, but you're talking about a much bigger phenomenon. The top incomes, if you like, uh, are starting to get their own national market for politicians uh, there. This means that what you've got is a series of political parties you can treat as, you know, presidencies gradually becoming a national market story. The, the House, uh, in particular, is still sitting there with a heavily locally oriented story. Uh, I mean, people you know, do make contributions to House folks. Um, but um, there's no, there's, to, to say there's a national market for House of Representatives folks running is crazy. The local parties did most of the money raising. We've got the books, say, of the New York uh, parties in, around the time of Tweed, uh, for example. And these guys raised something like $2 billion in, what, 1870 or 71, and if you translate what they were spending in modern terms, that's raised locally. Uh, they're all in torchlight parades, liquor licenses, and things like that. Um, and in that sense, the Gilded Age is a partial nationalization of the market for politicians, to put it simply and bluntly. What you've got going in the new Gilded Age is almost the reverse, the creation of a top-down market, not just for national politicians, that's been obvious for a long time, um, but for even the state and locals. If you look, I have, I have a paper on Congress where I sort of walk you through this. That's also on reserve uh, in the, or on your website there. Um, the, the short version of this is very simple. The seniority system collapsed as the um, main way you organize Congress. What did people do? Well, they call it at the time the California system. Uh, in some, which, which meant you went to your, you tried to buy votes to get yourself elected uh, to a, com a, either on, onto a committee or get elected as a chair. Um, pretty soon in the mid 1980s, you saw folks <coughs> getting the whole organized so called leadership packs, which then spread like wildfire. Now there are hundreds of them. And the FEC undercounts them seriously. Those numbers are not, that most people use, aren't reliable. Um, the, uh, to make a long story short, your modern parties, the, the guy who brought the innovation in in this who really was Newt Gingrich uh, and his folks who tried remaking the Republicans and then the Democrats just copied this system uh, from 1994 on, is they basically started just auctioning off in a, with party positions. The, the Democrats actually compile these Sears catalogs, which you, you can find some of them on the web, um, of positions like this. If you want a major party <coughs> committee, you've got to raise 400000 and give 200000 to your own. I've got all of this sitting in that article uh, there. The Republicans, being Republicans, I guess, don't publish the fixed, the, the sort of published prices. Instead, you negotiate with the leadership. But uh, if you look at Lou DeBose's fine book on Tom DeLay. DeLay is sitting there as they're doing the committees with the printouts of how much each everybody gave. Now, what this does is change the whole structure of the Congress. This is a really interesting point, and it's not uh, developed enough in any of the normal congressional literature. What, what, what folks are, individual congressmen and women are effectively being told, you need to contribute yourself, and people do know, and the literature on money in Congress does say plainly, yeah, for uh, funny self uh, for financing by congressmen and women to other congressmen and women has gone way up. 
Um, yes, but a large chunks of that are directed into the party committees for Congress, the National Republican or National Democratic Committees, you know, Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee for the House, the one for the Senate. There, what this those part those committees though are basically controlled by the leadership. They're not. So what you're actually doing, it's sort of like you're turning the individual member of Congress is while they're trying to buy their committee assignment um, and slots there are also building a much stronger leadership structure. The leadership then takes that dough, and it remains true, the old generalization that, uh, yes, the, where this con congressional committee of the type of national con committee stuff is probably more important for open seats, but all representatives need access to that, those, um, <coughs> the services they provide. I, I, this will sound insane, but it's true. You can't solicit money from your office. Uh, even though that's now these people spend hours doing it. Friends of mine who work in the uh, house actually, they ask people to come and like to a hearing, and they'll say, "No, I got to die. I've got to raise money. I got to dial for dollars." I mean, why would I go to the hearing? You know, and it's actually somebody just said that to a friend of mine not, you know, like about two months ago. Uh, well, um, the thing is, um, you need you got to be able to dial for dollars from somewhere. A phone booth out there is not really the place. I mean, it'd be fun to imagine our salons with a big bag of quarters or something, or maybe just doing it on a credit card. What they actually do is they go to the, the party uh, headquarters there, that do, and you can call legally from there. Mm -hmm. um, they also have offices there where you can make a TV or a radio uh, spot uh, and things like that. It's really useful services, in other words. And so what this tends to produce is party line voting goes way up. Uh, now, there is one slight offset of this, which, and you all know what it is, and it's really in the Republican Party, uh, which is that uh, if there's a big block of money out there that's disaffected from the leadership, there's enough of it you can split the party. That was the Tea Party. Uh, in my 2012 paper with Paul Jorgensen and G. Chen, we walk you through some of the Tea Party differences uh, in Congress there. Um, but now here's, so <clears throat> my suggestion is, uh, if you're living in a new Gilded Age, and given that, unfortunately, your both parties are completely dominated by big money, um, albeit they don't agree on everything, but on the stuff that matters to you, they're not going to disagree a lot, except on the cultural issues, which they all love to luxuriate in, precisely because they can go do what they want in the economy. Uh, all of you are familiar with the Republican move where we talk endlessly about abortion, then somehow it never quite have, comes to a full vote. I mean, you may vote 38 times on it in the House, but somehow it doesn't pass uh, much. Democrats do much the same with minimum wage legislation, though this year they probably will have to try to produce a vote. Um, indeed, the whole Democratic Party is in the process of talking about inequality, even as their policies you know, on banks, on income taxes, uh, or for that matter, the sort of more complex issues in, in, in national investment patterns of things like why, why give away all the stuff from the National Institute of Health to pharmaceuticals. Um, they're not doing much about reducing inequality. Just, um, anyway, if you live, just ex consider the possibility that you are, in fact, going to live in a new Gilded Age. What might make that different? Well, one thing I think won't be different, which is that both major parties will gradually let voter turnout erode. Um, the, uh, the Republicans are going to are obviously taking the lead on this, but I mean I actually had trouble and actually wrote some stuff in the uh, early in the Obama administration. I couldn't understand why they weren't bringing legislation in to. Um, end the kinds of electoral abuses you saw in 2000. I mean, while you can't tell states how to do elections, you can offer them cash or incentives to uh, fix up some of the truly ridiculous stuff. They did. In, in 2012, they realized they were going to lose if they didn't get turnout up. And while, I mean, in fact, turnout went down, dropped three points, which is a fair amount, uh, the, um, they, they've been talking turnout. <laughs> the, um, 
and they will talk some more around election time. But I, I'm not sold that there's anybody, I'm not sold that there's many people in the Democratic Party that really want to see turnout rise. If you want to see that happen, what you need to look at usually are state secretaries of state. And like I live in Massachusetts, and most, uh, when the Secretary of State reports voter turnout, he always misreports it. He, he gives you the percentage of eligible voters, who, pardon me, percentage of registered voters who voted, and ignores the vast numbers of people who are not registered. And they don't really work very hard, and do in fact often nothing to register the large numbers of people that um, are not registered, and it's caused some stir, particularly in the Hispanic communities, uh, where I mean, people complain that, say, registrars are uh, easily created, uh, or schemes to get voter turn up in Wellesley or Weston, rich communities, um, just aren't go off in the poorer areas. Um, and, you know, this in general uh, is look beneath the rhetoric. When turnout starts to rise, you know it. And it generally is attended by a lot of yelling and screaming. Uh, and I'm not, at any rate, my, my best guess is uh, you will find some resistance in the Democratic Party to turning down voter turnout, but I'll believe it when I see it, when that becomes a sort of getting turnout up becomes a major um, objective. Um, where I think, however, this whole, in that sense, this is not maybe too appetizing a prospect from a policy standpoint, depending for some people, of course, it's not the problem, it's the solution, but never mind. Um, the, uh, you know, we, I would point out that, you know, you, the whole progressive period in American history did occur during that big turnout decline. That's a pretty interesting point. And it's one well worth thinking through. That was not, I mean, I mean, while it's often, a lot of American history has tended to run the progressives as though they were the residual legatee of the populace, they weren't. I mean, the, po the folks who represented the populace mostly got nothing at all uh, out of there. And, uh, and I would not see this as one sort of sweeping triumph from William Jennings Bryan to Franklin D. Roosevelt. It's an entirely different story. Uh, are nearly so. But I think what ought to give you pause in any new Gilded Age operation uh, is basically this. In the old Gilded Age, the U.S. <laughs> was pushing on open door in many quite literally senses. I mean, I'm thinking of the notes from uh, Secretary of State John Hay, who was uh, married into an enormous Cleveland iron uh, and steel fortune. Um, the, uh, under <coughs> early in the century. But more broadly, uh, I mean, it's no secret that the U.S. pushed its way first in the Caribbean and then after World War II around the world, uh, turning it, if you like, into the American century. That, I'm not saying that was easy, but it was not one that was sort of like at all that difficult for the United States. The situation you're in right now strikes me as exactly the opposite. That is to say, um, if you look closely, um, the U.S. is plainly in a very relatively weakened position, um, though most of the noise about, I mean, the, when you get, uh, who was it? It was a Joint Chief of Staff guy who said, uh, well, you know, the, we have to get the deficit down. That's a threat to our national security. Actually, that's not your problem. Your problem is to get your growth rate up. Uh, if it doesn't grow, you can just forget. Um, and it's not growing. And there is no prospect of it growing rapidly anytime soon, uh, pursuing the kinds of austerity policies both parties uh, are sold on. Uh, but the thing to watch here is the globalization that is the enthusiastic sort of mantra of most of the American business community in both parties really is sort of one of the bottom line parts of that is uh, we, you don't recognize spheres of interest. There's a kind of, the, you have a world market approach where anybody can go anywhere they like. Uh, this sort of global law, I mean, this, this expressing itself sometimes not uh, in language about 
uh, globalization and international law and things like that. The concrete meaning of that uh, is the U.S. still takes on the global policeman role. Now, Obama talked a lot about leading from behind. He's not, he never actually does this when push comes to shove, um, the, with the possible exception of the Middle East. But, you know, even there, in Libya, they said they let the British and the French lead, then somehow it was the American planes that actually pushed. I mean, that was not leading from behind. He's now sitting in a confrontation with Russia, having announced uh, that he was making a pivot to the Pacific and sort of pushing himself in, into uh, what is plainly, Americans have plainly encouraged the Japanese. Uh, one could go on about this at great length. And they brought down, uh, for sure, one Japanese government, uh, along with a lot of people in Japan, uh, and are now sort of sitting there uh, with a very tense Pacific Island, uh, sorry, tense Pacific Ocean relationship. I mean, my sense is, is that this is too expensive. You can't do it. Uh, this is not like 1912 um, the, uh, or 1920 or 1945. Uh, and that um, the new Gilded Age is sort of like living beyond its means when it comes to international relations. Uh, and, that's, and, that, and that's a vital interest of the, many of the business companies that uh, give into both parties. You know, one of the nice things about the WikiLeaks uh, documents, when you pulled those out, the ones that uh, turn up as well, uh, that, that particularly the, the State Department documents, you just look at what they do. Most of the time it's some workaday international economic issue uh, between uh, that's, that's very plainly related to a mix of geopolitics and economics. I mean, that's just, that's just what they do. Think of it as your tax dollars at work. And so while you're, you're, you're sort of sitting there, uh, while Apple, you know, the Apple uh, computer, for example, does all of those elaborate tax deals, I, I can't keep them straight, double Dutch this, Irish that, uh, I, there was even one claim that somehow there was a convent involved that is a sort of conduit for something or other. I, I, I can't tell you whether that's true or not. What you do know is the international tax avoidance is enormous. But they expect the government to sort of, you know, batter down whatever problems there are in whatever part of the world they're trying to do business in. Uh, and not only they, but Citigroup and everybody else. Um, this is probably unsustainable. Um, and uh, you know, my guess is the new Gilded Age is not likely to have uh, a sort of peaceful, I'm not, I don't think the new Gilded Age was all that happy. So The old Gilded Age was all that happy. I just, I just don't see this um, here. It looks more to me like the, um, it, it, the, the previous financially dominated country that did a kind of overextended itself in the world economy, and that was, of course, Britain. You know what happened there, which was the Liberal Party, uh, which one might want to read as the Democrats. Uh, the uh, Liberal Party, by the strange death of Liberal England, took about 10 or 15 years, uh, maybe 20 under some reasonings. But in the end, uh, the, the situation polarized between a resurgent labor movement um, and, um, and a, a, a conservative party. And in 1931, the liberals melded away, either, most nearly all of them joining uh, the conservatives. And you've got a labor and a conservative party uh, there. I mean, my, my sense is, you know, history doesn't quite repeat itself, but it does rhyme, as somebody said. Uh, and I think there's probably not much in the existing party system dominated as it is by big money for labor for the labor movement. And while and, and they still put up a lot of money. My colleagues and I, I think we've got the only reliable data on this. I, I know the Center for Responsive Politics underestimated uh, their their our our totals have something like forty seven million dollars in the presidential race by labor and what's well over two hundred. Uh, I think around 240 in the various congressional races. That's enough money that you could actually do something uh, if you wanted to do it. So far, they haven't really, I think, tried to do 
Yeah, yeah I was just going to say that normally we go to 5.30, and I was wondering if yeah, we, I'll stop. I mean, we that, that's leave it. some time I'm, for I'm, questions. Yeah. Yeah. Time for any questions? Yeah, that's yeah. what I was suggesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got at least 15 <clears throat> minutes, and I'd stay later if people want to stay. <laughs> I've uh, wanted to ask you about two things, and maybe you talked about them yesterday. I wasn't here, so if I missed them, I apologize. Um, one is um, when you were talking, to, you showed that interesting uh, chart about mergers, and uh, I wondered if you had done any analysis to correlate that with, a, with the attitudes of the Justice Department towards antitrust uh, over the years. Yeah, I obviously, have. sometimes it's more enforcing antitrust laws and sometimes it's not. And of course, you went back to before there were even antitrust laws. And the other question had to do with whether, I know some people seem to think that one of the huge problems with the way we've gotten to where we are now had to do with the creation of our central bank, starting out from the uh, Jekyll Island meeting. Yep. And I wonder how that plays into any of this or whether it's sort of okay. relatively irrelevant. <laughs> um, it's not irrelevant. Ask. I mean, as it is, I mean, look, I think about a week or two after he left the central bank, Ben Bernanke had went out with what? Uh, was it a talk or a dinner with some bankers and got paid something like 200000 I mean, you know, This is just to read what's in the, uh, uh, probably the Huffington. Post, my guess is where probably that story was. I, it, after 2008, when the Fed stepped in with all those big loans, especially to the various countries to provide dollar loans for countries whose companies needed dollar loans and already, because that, that was a sort of, as all the money began fleeing into the, uh, back into the U.S. and a couple other poor countries. Uh, I think anybody who writes off the central bank as irrelevant would, would they need their head exam. Um, but let me, I want to pick up on the antitrust then come back very quickly to the central bank story. Um, antitrust issue, I have nothing to add. But like I think there's an old paper by George Stigler who, uh, and some folks who noticed that if you brought a big antitrust case, you got your budget cut by Congress. Um, it's been a, look, it, it's just how sick the place is, is that Time Warner Comcast merger, then anybody can actually contemplate letting those two merge. And, and with a straight face, just tells you how crazy the antitrust discussion is. I mean, th this is really nuts. Uh, I mean, I can guarantee you your cable rates will rise under that. It's just like all these guys who told you in the mid 90s that they passed the Telecom Act of 1996. I remember some Brooking studies on this that how there would be all this competition. You know, has anybody seen their telecom rates go down in the last 15 years? I mean, I know the answer to that question already. Um, no. uh, and I mean, that's just, that's, the economic analysis is worthless. Uh, the legal analysis is dishonest. Uh, and that's that. Um, on the central bank story, um, <clears throat> so the short, simple matter is, um, Roosevelt kind of did OK on the, 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 the um, Banking Act of 1935 did nationalize control of the central bank um, in the sense that it was pulled out of the hands of the New York Fed. It created the, recreated the governance of the Open Market Committee, which had been in existence uh, for well before that. Um, and it put control of it back, in effect, under... Um, even though it had this split structure with private banks, in some fundamental sense, it was nationalized and put under the control of the government. Nothing like that happened under Dodd-Frank. I mean, there's basically no major change in the structure of governance of, finan of the financial um, community and the government. There's just nothing like that. Um, and in that sense, uh, you know, I don't have anything to add to the people who just say, hey, they, they've gotten away with murder. Uh, there. I would caution against all gold standard schemes and all schemes that tell you you can get along without a central bank. That's not true. Um, I, these days, I now, I mean, there is a, just a fine course up on the web by a friend of mine, Perry Merling, up on the INET website, the Institute for New Economic Thinking. Uh, 
You can just find his course on money and banking, and it's, I think it's thoroughly sensible uh, in terms of what's wrong with gold standards and things like that. They're, they're all pro-cyclical. The gold standard didn't give you um, stable prices in the 19th century, and it won't. That's why you, you can't get out of having uh, a central bank. Uh, you just need one that operates for the population instead of for bankers. And right now, um, you can see if you look closely, we could, this is another lecture in a different environment, uh, the extension of swap agreements and things like that completely out between central banks outside. They're creating a sort of super backstop for too big to fail banks, uh, just way beyond anything uh, that anybody ever voted anywhere. Uh, but that's, uh, no, the financial community is really still out of control. And they, and, and that's that. I mean, that's, this is the single largest uh, political factor maybe in the whole system. It's far from the only one. There, I mean, the telecom people, you know, I mean, are ripping you off. Your utilities are ripping you off. Uh, a whole host of people, uh, and indeed the just general decay of sort of basic law. I mean, you know, where does General Mills get off saying if you do their Facebook site that you've given up your rights to uh, suits or whatever? Now they back down from that. I mean, when a company, when a situation where companies think they can do that, and the federal government does, the Federal Trade Commission does not immediately step in to say this is ridiculous. You're out of control. I mean, it's, this is crazy. Yeah. Well, okay. You're up. Uh, yeah. yeah. Now, I, um, I'm sorry if I missed this, but I was hoping maybe if you could restate if you did, but uh, why you think there wasn't a realignment in 2008? I think there was, but what you've got is effectively two right. We, I mean, we're looking for a classic, let's remake the system. Thing. It looks to me like a kind of 68 deal. The Democratic advantage just disappears, and you get two. I mean, my reading of what happens in the next 30 years, despite all the talk, say the Kevin Phillips inspired stuff about you know the emerging Republican realignment, didn't happen. They they got control of the national government. They didn't get control of Congress till the 90s. When they got control of Congress, they didn't have control of the presidency. Um, the, no, I think 2008 will turn out that the characteristics of the political, like the Democratic share of the vote, I suspect, will probably, I regret to say, drop. Um, and turnout's probably headed down, and you're going to get a sort of more conservative party system. But I'm not, I'm not looking for, you may, maybe it'll turn out to be a Republican-dominated one. I kind of doubt it. Um, I think you'll probably see two conservative party seesaw uh, back and forth. I might be wrong. Yeah? And just going forward, you'd say over the next 10, 20 years, how do you see the, the balance of power between, you know, business interests and changing given technological changes? And, how, and then, that's the first question. The second question, how would that influence um, policies in your view? Going okay. Because that door, I couldn't quite hear your question. Just, just going forward in the medium term, how do you see like different factions of business interests and influence over the government shifting? Do you expect, I don't know, finance to remain in the driving seat, or do you see, you know, like a growing importance of like technology firms, etc.? And do you okay. see here, like here, a, if I had to say, what's the Obama vision for America? Progressivism in a low, in a minor key, you might call it with nudge as the theory, which is just preposterous if you're trying to actually like rein in business interests. Um, it's Silicon Valley. Um, the, there is a, a, a considerable uh, split, both rhetorical but also in reality. Um, the plain fact is, is that the US government uh, actually does a huge amount of investment in stuff that aids business. I mean, the national, the, the way, for instance, in pharmaceuticals you compete, um, Bill Lazonic's work on this I think is just terrific. Uh, the way you compete in pharmaceuticals is uh, you don't do in house research. Um, that you've shut and you're buying back your stock with the dough. Um, 
you go down to the National Institute of Health, find out what they're doing, and in one way or another, you know, hire the researcher, hire their students, find some way to sort of commercialize the uh, what what the government investment is doing in that. Um, there's actually uh, programs in energy and defense are enormous. They're not small. And there's a lot of folks that would like to see those increased. I mean, now, we can all argue about what you think the real relations were between uh, the NSA and the various companies. Now, I have a view on this, which is that the evidence that there was more collaboration <coughs> and conflict there is very strong. When you actually look at the written evidence that's around, uh, I lay it out in our, our electoral piece that is, is on their website, um, for example. And when you get large chunks of the Republicans saying just shut the government down or just let's cut all, just shrink everything, that, that's not a, a position that, that every business sector can possibly accept. They don't. Um, and you, you get some muffled infighting in the Republican Party. In other cases, they just go straight in the, you know, the Democrats, which don't have a problem on that. Uh, and that's, I mean, th this has been a very old fight. Um, I mean, in 90, in the early 90s, when Clinton was running for the first time, I mean, Robert Rubin had that committee on reindustrialization or whatever the buzzword at that point. And Laura Tyson was, I think, running the research for it. Um, and I mean, this this bit, and this, what were they? They used to be called in the 80s. This may date me to the to an Egyptian dynasty, Atari Democrats. Uh, I am old enough to remember that phrase. Um, you know, Atari has passed. You probably don't even know what it is. You know, I can hardly blame you. It was a computer company. Um, and um, so this is actually not going to disappear. Uh, and so I'm not expect so. Uh, then there is uh, inside finance. You get some folks who are miffed and somewhat fearful. If a large bank goes down, you just do the whole thing again that you did in 2008. Um, for sure, that agitates some folks. Uh, I mean, it, this this whole world is sort of stable because of the European Central Bank's line about. When Draghi said, I'll oh, do whatever it takes, he's basically saying he's the buyer of last resort for any and all bonds that banks or countries need to sort of keep going uh, there. You know, you pull that out of the system, and uh, the American the financial contagion is, is, is still a quite live possibility for stuff. Uh, it's, it's a heavily intervened system that keeps it uh, going. People know that. They don't necessarily like it. Uh, so I don't know if that answers, but that's my sort of short version. Yeah. And I get some read something that uh, the crash of 1893, you know, was a, was sort of the first signal that you know the regime, the financial uh, controllers of both political parties were wasn't working. And then he had a series of ups and downs. That, you know, they did control the political process, so nothing changed. There was no real reform until 1907, the last crash. And then in Wisconsin here, we had a, an earlier one. And, and, and uh, the problem, La Follette, our governor in 1900, he came in with one issue, and that was to um, Take let citizens participate more in the selection of their their representatives. Before then, they were all picked by these on both parties. Well, today I've been studying Wisconsin legislature and kind of have a database on it. And, and it went back to um, same issue. The Follets came in with one issue, and that wasn't changed the voting, and that was it. the older primary did it. Nowadays we have a direct election of senators, right? Yeah. yeah, but nowadays that doesn't work anymore, and and, and the, the money in politics comes through legislative leaders. Yeah, and and it they, comes a lot of it. A lot of it comes out of state. Too. Yeah, almost. <coughs> so Alec, 2011, 12 legislature was really the Alec legislature. All, you know, the most important issues in 
all the areas of public policy you know, came from this one art source. And I developed the Alex scorecard that shows that Republicans are, the lowest voting Republican is 92%. You know, most of them are 100%. Yeah. And, and so, see, so it's not going to work to have a primary. You've got to somehow cut that link no, that's right. away I, the flow of the money to the legislative leaders. And how do you... Um, well, this is the problem, given like that, as best as I can tell, uh, the Supreme Court seems to think that any regulation of political money, I mean, I, I read these guys as basically just saying, you can't do anything to regulate uh, these folks. And now this is a thought I think I incompletely developed <coughs> in my talk, this nationalization from the top down. It's now, you're exactly right, it now, the, the same uh, sort of hurricane-like circular flow of cash around that appears in presidential and congressional races goes straight into the le state legislatures now. Yeah. And, and, you know, in some cases, into the local uh, races. I mean, and most of this money is coming across state lines. Uh, and that's an amazing shift from stuff you had before. Uh, I mean, my colleagues and I are actually about to try to estimate exactly how much money comes in um, in each congressional district, which is the place um, from inside the district. Uh, our first calculations were microscopic. Now we got to check them and things like that. Uh, but this this number is going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's a total nationalization of the thing. And it, it I mean, the problem the, the problem this presents for reform is really acute because. The progressive movement, you know, on a declining voter base, typically made appeals to sort of middle class and a fair number of quite affluent Americans. I mean, there were a lot of progressives. I mean, if Charles Evans Hughes was also the leading progressive, was the attorney for the Standard Oil Company and real need or an advisor. Um, the, uh, for example, and there are lots of other cases like that. Um, in the, uh, that would usually get started by some governor uh, or local politician somewhere saying, we're going to toss the machine out and we're going to do this. Now you get this flow of cash nationwide that tends to smother those efforts real fast. And I mean, a case that I, I find quite striking and is very much worth your time is uh, what happened to pension systems in states after 2008, because in the private sector, um, a lot of folks, when they lost, when they got hit with cash, um, when, they, when they got hit in the downturn, they would go back to the guys that sold them that junk, you know, the AAA rated stuff that was worthless, and say, either buy this back or we sue you. And a lot of people got a lot of money back uh, in the private sector that way. Um, almost no state has done this. Uh, and, you know, I and others have been asking, you know, how come not? Uh, the answer is not nice. It's you have you know, attorneys general and governors now have their own national party funds. You never hear about them. The Democratic Attorneys General and the Democratic Governors Association, the Republican Governors Association. Uh, then they have they now have an attorneys general one that used to be part of something else. <coughs> Just I think went independent. Um, these get contributions from precisely the folks that should be regulated. Um, and then they you, 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 and then they just dump the cash into the state races, and you don't hear about this. You just, it's almost no writing about this. I mean, it's just nothing. Um, and uh, it's sort of cut the guts out from the states. I mean, that's called creative federalism with a sort of bitter irony that people weren't uh, quite prepared for. So I'm just going to interrupt here and say we're past our normal time. We also have an opportunity tomorrow at 1220, other side of the building, to have a more extended conversation, very informal mode, unstructured, bringing up whatever topics you like, um, keeping with the themes of his visit. So that's another opportunity to have more of a conversation.